Hello, today's lecture is on light and the essential question is what is light and how do wave properties impact what we see? So just like the last one on sound, light is a critical part of interacting with our environment and communicating and so hopefully this lecture will help you understand a little bit about what it is and how we, um, we use that wave as a form of communication. So what is light was actually a question that really perplexed scientists for a really long period of time because light is really, really small and really, really fast and hard to tell. But we now know what light is. Um, light is a series of electric and magnetic fields moving through space. What an electric and magnetic field is, is a deeper question that we go into if you take AP Physics 2 class. Um, but it's basically a wave of electricity and magnetism. We know that light is a transverse wave, um, even though we can't see it jiggling. We have a tool called a polarizer that lets us prove that, and I'll show it to you in class. Um, but for now, you can just write down that it's transverse. And the one thing that makes light really, truly unique amongst all waves is it is the only kind of wave that does not need a medium to travel through. Um, light can move through what's known as a vacuum or just empty space. Um, which means that we can see the light from stars because there is nothing out there, right? It's just empty, empty outer space, but light can still get through there. Sound and other waves cannot move through the same um, emptiness. So that's a really unique property of light. So what creates light? Well, technically, light is created by electrons inside of an atom jumping from a high energy orbital to a lower energy orbital. And in that process, they're going to release some extra energy as a tiny, tiny piece of light. So I don't know if you've covered um, atoms and electrons in middle school science. We're actually going to cover it in more detail in our next unit. Um, but an atom generally looks like this. It's this tiny little nuclear, or big, that red nucleus in the middle is where the protons and the neutrons live. And the electrons, which are the negatively charged pieces of atoms, um, are around the outside of the atom. And those electrons can exist in these different shells. And sometimes an electron is in a farther away shell and when it jumps back to the closer shell um, it loses energy and because of conservation of energy um, it creates a little tiny piece of light called a photon. The reason we sometimes hear light known as an electromagnetic wave um, in addition to the fact that it's created through electric and magnetic fields is because it comes from the movement of electrons. Um, most of the light that you see out there is from a process known as black body radiation. So when you look at like, for example, the sun and the light that's coming from it or a light bulb in your room that's creating light, um, what's happening is there's some kind of heat, there's some kind of thermal energy that is pushing the electrons out. And then as they jump back, as we mentioned above, we're going to um, be releasing that energy as the form of light. Typically, there's some type of nuclear or chemical energy that is going to be replenishing the thermal energy. So what's really being used up over time is this chemical energy or the nuclear energy. So um, in the stars, for example, we use up the nuclear energy, turn it into thermal energy, then turn that into light energy. Black bodies are going to produce all the frequencies of light, which is kind of interesting, and we'll talk about what that looks like later on. So the sun is a black body and it obviously emits light, but it turns out that every single object in the universe is a black body. Even you are a black body. And that means you are spitting out light all the time. Um, we typically can't see the light that comes off of humans because it's a color we don't, our eyes don't detect. Um, but snakes and other animals that can detect heat, the heat of an object, they're actually detecting um, that black body radiation coming off of a person. I found this funny thermal imaging of a person that was farting in, I think, an airport line. So anyway, um, that person, you can see the, the warmer parts of their body are emitting more of this thermal energy and the cooler parts of their body or their clothing are emitting a little bit less of this black body thermal energy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how your eyes actually then take this light that's all around us from these black bodies and turns it into useful information. Well, the first thing is that in order to see something, light from that object has to go into that pupil in the center of your eye, uh, which is that black spot in the middle of your eye. So if this is a leaf and it's um, emitting black body light for some reason or a different kind of light that's reflecting off of it, um, that light photon has to leave that leaf and it has to actually go right through the hole in your pupil. 
the next thing that, that light hits is this object here known as the lens. And you've probably heard of the word lens before, um, if you've seen glasses. And the lens does the same thing that lens and glasses do. It actually bends the light and causes it to focus on the back of your eye, actually. It concentrates the light into a single point. The cool thing about the lens in your eye is it's actually adjustable. So unlike the lens in your glasses that are stuck at a certain curvature and a certain thickness, the lens in your eye, there's these muscles that can stretch it or shrink it, um, which allows you to focus on things at different distances. So you're, when you want to see something really close to your eye, it's going to be squished in a certain direction. And then when you want to see something far away, it's going to stretch out in the other direction. So that light goes through the lens in your eye, and then it comes together in the, at the back of your eye again uh, on a tissue known as the retina. So the retina is actually a tissue that covers the entire back of your eye um, and is actually the object that is responsible for detecting the light and determining which uh, properties that light actually has. So what light properties can we detect with our eyes? Well, um, if you zoomed in on the retina, you would see these special cells known as cones and rods. And cones and rods allow you to detect two things about light. They let, let you detect the frequency and the amplitude of the light. The rods were actually the first of the human eye cells to develop, and animals that have very rudimentary or primitive eyes have rods in them because they're the ones that let you detect um, the difference between high and low amplitude of light. The cones um, are specialized cells that let us sense the frequencies of the light. And different people and different species have different kinds and numbers of cone cells, as we'll talk about in just a minute. So the amplitude of light is related to the energy, which we learned about before. Um, and generally, more amplitude means that the electric and magnetic fields are stronger and we interpret that as brightness. So when the rod cells in our eyes detect a lot of these photons, lots of the tiny pieces of light, um, strong, strong electric and magnetic fields, um, that to us is the brightness of the light, kind of like for sound, how the amplitude was the volume. The rod cells, which detect frequency, will actually allow you to determine the color of the light. Now, if you remember for hearing, we were detecting 20 to 20,000 hertz, which seemed like a lot of hertz. For light, the typical human vision range is between 400 and 750 trillion hertz. And different frequencies are going to correspond with different colors, just like different sound frequencies correspond with different pitches. Um, so if you've heard of, you know, Roy G. Biv or the colors of the rainbow before, uh, you probably know that it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, um, but there's not really a specific dividing line between those things, right? Not everybody always agrees on what's orange and what's yellow and what's yellow, yellow, orange, and orange, orange, yellow, yellow, because it's actually a spectrum, just like sound is and music is, where you can have a color anywhere in that frequency, and um, and your, your eye is going to be able to detect it as color, and it doesn't necessarily have a specific name. Interestingly, there are quite a few colors that we don't see, and we'll be talking about those in class as well. Um, and hopefully you see, first thing, in that rainbow, there's quite a few colors that um, probably you know of colors that are not in that rainbow. Um, and then there's colors that we don't even, we have words for them, we don't know what they look like because our eyes can't detect them. So we'll talk about those in class. Okay, so you probably um, have added colors before in your life, in art class, or just at home when you were playing around, but this is actually a different thing. We're talking about adding colors of light instead of adding colors of paint. Um, and it happens because even though we can see all of the different colors of the rainbow, we actually only have three specialized cones that detect red, green, and blue light. We actually don't have a special cone for yellow or purple or um, orange, those colors. Uh, and so the question is, how do we see all the colors when we only have detectors for three of them? And the answer is that our brain actually invents all those other colors by combining the signals from the red, green, and blue lights. So if you were looking at just a plain red light, the red cones in your eye would be going, woo, red, and the other cones would not be making any kind of excited signal at all. 
Um, and same thing, if you saw just blue, it would be wee, exciting, right? Um, but when you see two colors at once, so if the red detector and the blue detector are both going woo, your brain doesn't think we're looking at two colors. It combines the information to make a single color in your brain. And that's known as color addition. So down here, it is um, kind of looks like a chart you may have seen before, um, but it shows what you get when you add together the different colors. So when you, your brain sees red and blue at the same time, instead of thinking, oh, we're seeing two colors, your brain actually invents this color called magenta, which isn't in the rainbow. That's like a pink color, right? It's not in the rainbow. Um, and uh, your brain, tells you that we're, we're seeing this color uh, that, is, that is pink and magenta. So whenever you see pink, what's actually happening is the red detector and the blue detector are both getting activated. When you see green and blue at the same time, then we have this color called cyan that our brain kind of figures out. And red and green at the same time actually create yellow. So your brain, when you see yellow light, the reason you know it's yellow is because those two detectors, the red detector and the green detector, are both equally active. And that is true when you look at a plain yellow piece of paper, but you could also make the same color by shining red and green lights at the same time into your eyes. Interestingly, stoplights are actually made out of red and green. The yellow light in the when you drive past a stoplight in the street is not actually yellow light. It's actually red and green, tiny little red and green lights that you can't tell the difference. If you uh, look, zoom in on your phone or put a tiny piece of water on the, the screen of your phone or your computer so that it kind of blows up the, the little tiny pixels that are making up the computer, you'll see there isn't um, necessarily all the colors of the rainbow there. They're, the colors that we see are created by adding up the colors that are, um, that are red, green, and blue. And what happens if we see all three at the same time? All three of those cells are going crazy. Well, then our brain invents the color white. So white isn't in the rainbow. It's not actually a color of light at all. White is what our brain sees when all three detectors are equally stimulated by light. So that was color addition. Color subtraction is what you probably thought of when you thought of mixing colors in the first place. You actually were not adding colors together, you were subtracting them, and I'll explain. Most objects don't make their own light, okay? Well, they're making black body, but they don't make light in colors that we can see, right? Most objects, if you turn out all the lights in the classroom or in your bedroom, you actually can't see most of the objects in there with your eyes. So how do we see all the colors around us? Well, some other source of light, like the sun or your light bulb in your room, is creating white, which has, as we talked about, when we see white, actually what's happening is all the colors. So the sun, which looks bright white, is actually sending red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, all the colors in. And when that light hits an object, the object has something in it known as a pigment, which actually absorbs some of the light, okay? So this is white light coming from the sun. It hits that red flower. And you'll notice that the other colors of light disappear. They go into the flower. So the green, the blue, the purple, all those other colors get sucked into the flower. And the only thing that bounces off the flower is the red. And so then that red light bounces into our eye and we see the flower as red. Um, it's these special molecules named pigments that are inside of the, all the objects around us and they specialize in absorbing light. And what they're doing is they're actually turning it back into thermal energy, so they heat up. So when an object gets hit by sunlight, it heats up because it's absorbing some of the colors of light. So you can have a, a table for color subtraction as well. Um, and it basically shows that if you have a yellow pigment uh, or a yellow object around you, um, that object is subtracting blue, right? So it's taking all the white light that comes in, it's, it's removing the blue, and what's reflecting off is green and red. And so that's why we see it as yellow. Um, a, a primary pink magenta color um, will subtract out green and it lets the um, blue and the red bounce off. And so when you look at a pink paper, what you're seeing is white light minus green, right? We're seeing the red and the blue that did not get subtracted, they bounced off. And when you see that cyan paper, um, what you're actually seeing is white light coming in and subtracting out the red. And so the green and the blue bounce off and it looks cyan to our eyes. If we had a piece of paper that subtracted all the light, 
that would look black, right? So if you have a, a piece of paper that has all the colors of pigments, it's going to subtract everything. Nothing bounces off. Your brain doesn't get any light, and we interpret that as a black object. Um, and maybe it makes sense now if you know, like, what color shirt do you not want to wear outside when it's a really hot day? The answer is black, because instead of reflecting the light off that shirt and keeping you cool, it's absorbing all that light and turning it into heat, which is why black shirts get hot. So what light properties can we not detect with our eyes? Well, the first is the speed of light. You can't tell how fast light is going. Um, and like every other kind of wave, the speed of light does depend on the medium. Light does not have to go through a medium, but it can go through a medium, right? We know light can go through air because it's obviously here on Earth. It can go through water. If you're underwater, you can see light. It can go through um, glass and other things that are transparent. But typically light goes slower when it's moving through a solid or liquid than a gas. So this is the reverse from sound, and that's something that's a little bit tricky to remember. Um, light moves fastest when it moves through a, a vacuum because those electromagnetic waves don't have anything else that's getting in the way. There's nothing for them to have to uh, move around or jiggle, and so it actually moves fastest when it's moving through outer space. Um, that speed known as the speed of light in a vacuum is an incredibly important um, value in physics and it's a constant which means that physicists have have realized that light travels the same speed in a vacuum no matter what and um, it's known as nature's speed limit nothing in the universe can go faster than the speed of light in a vacuum and how fast is it 300 million meters every second um, that's super crazy fast. In, in that time, light can go around the Earth like three and a half times in one second. So it goes really, really fast. The moon is about one light second away. So when we see light coming from the moon, it takes one second to get from there all the way to Earth, um, which is kind of a neat fun fact. So what light properties can we not detect? Well, we, just like with sound, we can't tell what the wavelength of light is, but just so you know, we're talking about tiny, tiny wavelengths. Because even though the frequencies are really, really high, the velocity is really, really, really high, and therefore the wavelengths are really, really tiny. Um, this is a uh, chart known as the electromagnetic spectrum. You don't need to copy it all down or anything, um, but this will give you a hint about some of those colors that are beyond the, the range in which we can see, and we'll talk about those in class. Okay, so quick video summary. What is light and how do wave properties of light impact what we notice and what we see? and a fun comic to end it up. Thanks for watching.